Hey there, guys, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Survive Interviews. Today, I'm joined by a friend, a filmmaker, a podcaster, and an avid horror gamer. Uh, I'm joined by the wonderful Andy Stewart from Scotland. Hello, Patrick. <laughs> Are you going to do your Irish accent on this? Uh, no, no, no. I, I think it's that's better done when you're when you're not looking right at me. Uh, I think that the guilt comes into play too much. I, I can like turn my head to the side. <laughs> it's yeah, it works better over podcasts. That's that's fair. <laughs> um, so, Andy, uh, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do, all the magical things that you do. Oh. Um, well, I first met, I think it's probably prudent then to talk about how I first met you. Um, and that was a few years ago, I was making a bunch of short films, uh, kind of gross body horror short films. And, uh, Amazing you gross came away body horror with, short films. <laughs> and uh, you came over from Ireland to help me out when I was making Remnant. Um, I and I think uh, you got to kind of potter about on the set and like, were incredibly useful on set, actually. <laughs> Not to, I think pottering about kind of <laughs> undersells the the effort that you put in on it. But uh, yeah, that was kind of that was kind of when you we first properly met. I think. Mm, yeah. Um, so yeah, I made a bunch of film short films. They did well, and then um, I went through that phase. I'm still kind of coming out that phase that people go through, or some filmmakers go through, where they're just like, "What's the fucking point in this? Uh, everything I make, shit." Um, and uh, yeah, I, I didn't really uh, make anything for a couple of years, and it's only now that I'm starting to kind of get back into that. And uh, I had some stuff lined up, and then uh, good old COVID nineteen popped up and uh, locked us all in our houses. It's such a shit in game, uh, boss. Like, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like you know, sometimes you get a game, and the, the end boss is just a big fucking eye. <laughs> A blob with an eye, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just a big blob with an eye. That's COVID-19. <laughs> and it just kind of pulsates irritatingly. And it's got one of those unavoidable moves that oh, actually yeah. it fucking kills you. Uh, aside from that, I've got a podcast called Strong Language and Violent Scenes, which I do with my pal Mitch Bain. Um, and we've had loads of amazing people on it, yourself included, uh, from oh, the world of the horror and kind of comedians and all sorts of stuff so yeah that's been really really good fun um and it's kind of we've had like i mean we've had guests on that that we've got no no right in getting really at the the time we got them on we had guys like aj bowen on we had guys like graham resnick on and i think it was just uh yeah a lot of people were very willing to come on and talk about bad films <laughs> so yeah it's been really lovely I think it's because people are so passionate about bad films that they like, and that's why the podcast works so well. Because if everybody hates yeah. something that you love, you'll defend it to your death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I mean, I, I think in episode one, I said uh, I've been to parties where I've argued so vociferously for something that I've wound up just like walking out of a room. <laughs> No, it's such a good format for a show. Like I, every time I listen to it, I just uh, the reason I haven't really like thought about ever podcasting and stuff is I don't think I think I look at stuff like strong language behind scenes and I go I want to do something like that, as in that clever, yeah. but I've never come up with a clever enough idea. <laughs> um, it's just so I good. Wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say it was a clever idea, Paddy. We just stole it. Uh, <laughs> how did this get made? Do. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, but you truly but your we own. put it in the hands of the guest, I suppose. Yeah, 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 we put it in the hands of the guest, uh, and it's down to the guest to pick the film. So uh, it's much more personal than just me and Mitch tossing films back and forward for over a hundred episodes now. So every hey, guest Mitch. brings their own film, and it's it's up to them to kind of make the make their peace with how good or bad the film is. <laughs> By the way, like, congratulations again. I know I said it to you already, like, and uh, it was actually very cool to tune in this week and hear my little snippet. Uh, oh, congratulations yeah. on the 100 episodes. I mean, 
it's crazy because in some ways it feels like it only started, I'm sure this is much more the case for you, but in some ways it feels like it only started yesterday and then in other ways it's like, Jesus, it feels like it's been going on forever. Uh, in no way, Paddy, does it feel like it only started yesterday. <laughs> uh, this feels like a long journey and it's, it's funny to say 100 episodes because that's only like 100 weekly episode, mm. like the main episodes. Every Not Monday we episodes, do a yeah. mini episode as well. And we've done a bunch of kind of bonus episodes. So we're, we're somewhere in the region of 220 episodes. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, that is, the, that is the, the more mind-boggling thing when you look at it like that. It's pretty terrifying. Um, but it is an amazing show. And anyone check, listen, or checking this out should definitely listen to it. I mentioned it on last week's news episode as well. But I'll never stop loving find, this show. Keep, <laughs> thank you, mate. Thank you. Um, well, well, we'll keep doing it then, so you've got something to plug. Excellent. It's great, because that's, that's, uh, that's what I need. That I just need to keep plugging other people's content. That's what my content could be about. <laughs> but you're here today to chat with me because when I met you, when I came over to Scotland and was working with you on Remnant and everything, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about movies we loved. We talked about everything. But we also realized we were both pretty avid gamers and yes. especially horror gaming. So, yeah. Almost exclusively horror games for me. Um, I'm a kind of relaxed gamer. I, I can't play games online against people. I'm f- <laughs> and it's because I'm terrible at them, if same, I'm perfectly same. honest with you. Uh, I, yeah, it's just, uh, if I want to go out and get beaten up by children, if I want to get <laughs> beaten up by children, I'll just walk around Glasgow. Right? Uh, <laughs> The, the shame and embarrassment of being perpetually beaten by children is through the roof online. And there's no point. Like, I'm dead within two minutes and then I can hear them laughing at me. <laughs> it's soul destroying. So I'm, I'm much happier just kind of closing myself off and kind of finding my way into a world on my own. And I think that's why... I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a horror fan, so I'm automatically drawn to horror games, but I much prefer to just disappear into a kind of single-player story-based game and just lose myself in that, whether that's something like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which isn't a horror game, but I'll happily lose 100 hours in that or The Witcher uh, yeah. rather than spend hours and hours and hours getting mercilessly killed on something like Call of Duty. I, I'd be very similar to yourself in that, like, I've never gotten the, the multiplayer bug, um, per se. Like, there's been a handful of games I've played, but, like, who has the time to get good at that stuff? That's what I also don't understand. No. You need, like, a... a, a no, I, a, No, same as you. I'll gladly put 100, 200 hours into a game that I love, but I'm not going to put 100 two hours or 200 hours into, like, one map to get specifically good at that map in an online multiplayer yeah. game. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So you can learn where the best kind of bottlenecks are and the best sniping position. And then, so you can just park your ass there and fucking annoy everybody. And uh, giggle away uh, to yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I hate it. I hate on, I, I, I don't hate online gaming as a, I just hate that I'm so bad at it and that I can't be bothered getting good at it. Yeah. Even horror, I guess even horror games that have that element in it, like the Friday the 13th game or um, Dead, by, Dead by Daylight. Yeah, it's so hard uh, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're absolutely brutal and I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at them as well. Although my heart's in it more because it's a horror game. Yeah. I'm, I'm still like, oh, this is a, this is a fucking pain in the ass. And I, it, it is. I bought like all the licensed stuff for Dead by Daylight and I never play it. <laughs> like I never fucking play it because I'm, I'm rubbish at it. <laughs> I did the same thing. I, I I did the same thing with Mortal Kombat. They started releasing all these horror characters and all these licensed IPs, and I was like, ooh, ooh. And then all I do is really just play through. You know, you know, you can do like training. Oh yeah, yeah. But I just play with them on training because I don't want to take them into battle where I'll I'll be made to look like an idiot. <laughs> oh, but. It's, uh, it's cool what you're saying, though, about the single-player experience stuff, because that's, as I said, very similar to myself. Um, 
And I suppose actually take this right back. I mean, you're you're a horror fan, which uh, I mm. I am very aware of. And if anybody saw your arms or the, it, about sixty percent of your body, they'd they'd realise as well. <laughs> but yeah, you've seen more than sixty, Paddy. I've seen quite a lot. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's in it's in here. It's in here. <laughs> but uh, you're a big fan of horror. But do you remember? Specifically with gaming, what your kind of what was the game that got you to be like, oh shit, this medium is actually cool. I, I like this. Um, I think um, either Alone in the Dark or the original Resident Evil. I think mm. you know, I'm kind of showing my age here a little bit. I mean, I'm forty this year, so uh, I've been playing horror video games for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it was games like like the original Resident Evil, which at the time. I thought was just just the best thing in the world, um, despite the blocky graphics, which at that time were all you had to go on. So the best graphics you could get, uh, the terrible voice acting, which again was the best <laughs> you could get in a video game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, for me it was just as cinematic as video games got. I, I have this thing where I remember saying to my friend uh, at the time that I was like, "This is like playing a movie." Because, like, it was. It was the closest thing to playing a movie at the time other than, other than Night Trap. But nobody wants to play Night Trap. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it, the, the way it's framed, and certainly in those uh, original Resident Evil games anyway, where uh, it's very deliberate angles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think plays very, or leans very heavily into that kind of feeling like you're in a film. Because you, watching a film, um, you've got no control over how you watch that film. And in a video game, you've got, or in Resident, certainly in Resident Evil, you have no control of how you view that game. The mm. only thing you have control of is how you play the game. I think and as I've, well, I've always liked that about, that about the original Resident Evil games. I think that definitely adds to the horror as well because you don't have... You, if you're over the shoulder, you see what the character's seeing, seeing. Whereas when you have those fixed cameras, you are, if there's a corridor around the corner, you can't see what's down it. So you're automatically, immediately afraid. Yeah. Uh, I yeah, think this. Absolutely, yeah. I think the Silent Hill movie, when I think back on it, one of the things that it did quite well, one of the things that it did quite well was in the early parts of that movie, there was those kind of shots that literally replicated the fixed cameras from Paris to Silent yeah. Hill. Mm -hmm. And I was like, when I saw those moments in the cinema, I remember being like, this is the best movie ever. And then as it went on, that feeling slowly faded. You did like, because but... <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> sure, sure. We, we, all had the same, we all had the same experience, Paddy. Um, but no, I mean, Silent Hill again was another game that, I think Silent Hill was the first game that made me realize just how scary a video game could be. Like Resident Evil was scary, but once you've played through it and you've kind of lived it, when you revisit it again, that feeling's gone and you're left with the action. I, mm. I, I don't think it ever gets as tense again. But Silent Hill, like, it's always been like that. In fact, I, I powered it up about, about a year or two ago again just to play through the original one because I don't know why it's never happened up until now, but can we get a remake of the original know, Silent right. Hill? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's a terrifying game. Absolutely terrifying. And every way and it's yeah it's wonderful it's, it's probably my favorite horror game of all time the original silent hill yeah oh, i silent love hill too i i love well. i love that because i i always say that for me like everybody has such we know this from even the show that you do but everybody has such objective mm -hmm. personal tastes and like silent hill 2 is recognized as the best psychological horror game of all time and i understand that yeah. completely but I personally love three the most because that's the one that just for whatever reason, of, like for me personally, uh, I think it was because when I played two, I wanted it to be a sequel to one and it wasn't. Right. And then when I played mm. three, it was. Now, retrospectively, I've gone back and played two, I've been like, oh no, this is a fucking masterpiece. But at the yeah, time, I couldn't I, see it. I, I like the fact that the, the, it jumps from one storyline to another storyline and then it kind of loses itself in three and four and the storylines kind of overlap and four is a complete beast of its own like yeah the rooms are the rooms are wild experience 
um, which I'm never quite sure if I've ever liked. <laughs> I think I know exactly what you mean. I think, I, I, yeah, think, yeah. I think anyone who's played that game has that same feeling where it's like, I appreciate it. I think it's incredibly ambitious and it's incredibly weird, but I don't know if I'd, like, uh-huh. I, I've never felt compelled to play it again. I've never been like, oh, do I love to play? So I'm the room. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it, I, I, I get what you're saying and, and I absolutely appreciate them trying something with it, but yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a wet fart. And like, it had some interesting ideas, the big hole in the wall that you go into and you end up in different mm-hmm. places and stuff. But uh, that would be a game that I would be ter- terrified actually to replay during lockdown because it would be way too relatable. Um, just trapped in a room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to ask a question there, but I'll leave it off because we kind of already covered it. But you're, you were known... To, to me, especially, well, no, you were known by many of us horror fans as the body horror guy when it comes to your short films. Uh, okay. are, there any, yeah. are there any horror games you can think of that kind of, you would say, kind of really have that body horror element? Well, so the, there was a few things that kind of spring to mind, like good and bad. Like, I, I suppose you could say that some of Dead Space kind of hits what, I do. Uh, maybe even things like Clive Barker's Jericho, which is on totally the other end of the spectrum <laughs> Dead Space. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like, there's less out there that makes me go like, ooh, that's, that speaks directly to me and that's right in my wheelhouse. But I, I, guess, I, I guess there's bits of that in Resident Evil as well. There's bits of it in Silent Hill. Like, I guess all the anybody that mutates in Resident Evil, I suppose, is right in what I'm all about. So, there's one that I I always think of as for me a very body horror game, but it's not necessary. I mean, it is a horror, but it's not necessarily maybe always seen as one. Is Bioshock because Bioshock has a lot right. of the splicer. Ah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That that's the one that I always kind of gravitate towards, just because of all these people who decide to decide to fuck their bodies up because they can, because it's like, Hey, it's a society where you can do whatever the fuck you want. Cool. I'm going to look like a monster. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Did you, I, play, did you play the Bioshock sorry. games actually? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, I, I played them as and when they came out and then I got the, the triple pack collection when it came out. Uh, yeah, the Bioshock for me was kind of a, it was like that further development and how good a game could look mm, definitely, and how, how realized the game could be. And I think that Rapture as a, as a creation is still for me, one of the most perfect places a game's ever been set. Like it's, it's one of the most cinematic, unrealized, well, unrealized cinematically, mm. but cinematic within its kind of, I guess, the kind of narrow view of the video game places that I've ever seen. It's unbelievably good. And I would love to see it. That's a, that's a, a game that I would love to see scaled up to a film. Oh, definitely. And it's like, because I think I remember when I was playing Bioshock originally, thinking things like, oh my God, the production design in this game is amazing. And then having to remind mm-hmm. myself, oh wait, there's no production design per se. There is, but this is not a movie that you're watching. You know what I mean? But it was that. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Like, as you say, you just played it and we're like, how has nothing like this ever really been seen before? Even though we've all talked about Atlantis or the place under the ocean or whatever, like nothing like that. Um, and then personally, I, I know a lot of people felt a little bit divided on it, but I liked what they did with Infinite, with Columbia. It was a whole mm-hmm. different vision again. Um, but I think it was more, we've, we've all seen kind of floating cities in the clouds stuff in, in other media. Whereas I think Rapture, yeah. as you say, was totally one-off. Um, I think the thing with Rapture, though, is it, it maybe does have kind of limited appeal and uh, mm. how many times you could revisit it. Uh, so I think taking going to Colombia and going up rather than down 
as um, yeah, I think it was bold. I'm, I'm again, I'm not a massive fan of Bioshock Infinite. It's it's fine. I heard rumblings about a new one potentially. Mm. Um, I think, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know, but it's nice. It looks cool. Everything's floating about with little propellers on it. It's lovely, but it isn't Rapture. Um, yeah, but I, I guess I do appreciate that the, the kind of limited scope of returning over and over to this city where yeah you could chuck in different places we've seen a dent we've been to the dentists we've been to <laughs> numerous bars and nightclubs i mean what else what else does rapture have to offer the the play school we'll go to the play school this time have little baby splicers running around. i'm sure you do go to the play school because <laughs> um, i'm i'm sure you do that it doesn't there is a nursery in it. Like, there's a, I'm sure there's a bit in Bioshock or Bioshock 2 where you wake up and you're being tended by little sisters. That's two, yeah. That's in Bioshock 2. Yeah. Yeah. So that you do kind of see... That one's where you're a big daddy, so yeah, I think that's why you wake up and you have a little sister looking after you. Um, hmm. Well, are you the big daddy or big sister? Because, oh no, the big sister's the bad guy that one. Yeah, um, <laughs> the big sister. Those are bad to get. <laughs> um, so, right, this is, a, this is a question that I feel like I already know the answer to, but I'm, I'm kind of curious because I hope I'm wrong. Um, right. So tomorrow, if it's also a mad hypothetical question. Tomorrow, if somebody came along mm-hmm. to you and said, here is the budget to do whatever you want, and it, like so you could make a movie or a game, like they gave you enough money to make whatever kind of media you wanted to make, which would you make? Right. Well, well I, I, personally, I would make a film because I, I feel like the, I mean, I, I guess I, I know and you know people who have had films in development for a fucking long time. <laughs> uh, but it feels to me that the development and, and you've worked in video games yourself, you know, the, the actual development and create, creative process of a video game is just madness, absolute madness. And I, I don't think I have the patience for that. Um, so it would definitely be, I would make a film. Awesome. Um, cool. Oh, no, it's but, a- not the question I thought you were going to ask. I thought you were going to ask uh, what what game would I turn into a film? Ooh, but, well, yeah. I mean, actually, the, yeah. If you if you were asked to direct uh, an adaptation and they told you you could pick any licensed horror game property, what would you do? Dead Space. Dead Space. That makes so much sense. Andy yeah. Stewart's Dead Space. I'd watch the shit out of that. Um, <laughs> I can just see the part, speaking of kindergartens and nurseries, the part in Dead Space 2 where you have to go through the fucking, I think it's like a prenatal place or a postnatal place. There's all these cribs and shit. And it's yeah, just like... And the little, there's loads of little things coming yeah, at me. Yeah. It's fucking horrifying. That, I think that's <laughs> like, before I, before I played Outlast, that was the last piece of what I'd call like pure nightmare fuel that like really oh, yeah. fucking got under my skin. <laughs> Yeah, a few. I, I with Outlast and Outlast Two, there was a few points where I just had to like step away, just put the controller down, and just just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> the one that got I haven't played two yet, but the one that got me was the whistleblower DLC. There was there was some shit in there that legitimately mm-hmm. like I just went upstairs and hugged my children. I was like, <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, you should play two. Two is an intensely disturbing experience. I'm going to do it for the channel. That is definitely one that's up there for, for a play on the channel because I have a feeling I'm going to have... If, I, if my reactions to Outlast 1 that I remember them as were anything to go by, I'd say there'll be some good stuff on the channel to Outlast 2. And knowing you as I do and knowing the kind of films that you've made, I think there's a lot in Outlast 2 that will really speak to you. Uh, looking at The Perished and looking at films like uh, The Cheese Box and stuff like that. Mm. I think uh, there's there's definitely a lot there that that I think you'll find interesting. (laughs) I'm both slightly terrified by that and excited. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I I, I was going to ask you, of course, uh, like what I think you may have already answered with Silent Hill, but I was going to ask you, what's your favourite? horror game and obviously this question it's always hard because 
our, our, I think our tastes change a lot over time. But mm, yeah. uh, I guess I guess what's the one that lives in your head, like? Uh, and I guess the again maybe games that I've played to to death in every possible iteration are the first and second Resident Evil games. Um, Silent Hill 2 I've played countless countless times as well um, but I really do have like I said have a massive place in my heart for the first Silent Hill because that was when I realised that video games could be scary and could be cinematic in a way that Resident Evil couldn't quite hit I felt that there was always that certainly in the there was that kind of cartoonishness to Resident Evil and a kind of tongue-in-cheekishness to Resident Evil that is present in Silent Hill, but it's dialed down to a much, much darker level. Like, mm. There are in-jokes and Easter eggs in Silent Hill, but they're far darker and you have to look a lot harder to find them. Uh, Resident Evil 2, um, they must have come out around about the same time, Resident Evil yeah. 2 and Silent Hill. Um, they both came out about 98, yeah. For me, Silent Hill. Yeah, yeah. Silent Hills where I where I gravitate towards because it's just darker, it's moodier. The soundtrack blew me away. Again, it was like, wow, you can do that. You can put that kind of soundtrack in a in a video game. It's um, it's funny because I was only talking to Mitch the other day, uh, Mitch Bain, who you do strong language with, and we were yeah. we were talking. He was asking me about video game music because I, I was actually looking to get him to do a bit of music for the channel. And uh, right. what I sent him was the Silent Hill 2 official soundtrack. I was like, just listen to this. It's unbelievable. Uh, Akira Yamioka is one of the best composers ever. Yeah. And uh, straight away he came back to me and was like, holy shit, I really like this. This is really good. And like, Mitch can be very picky about stuff. Like he can be like, yeah, you know if you get a, yeah, it's good from Mitch that it's like, oh, he didn't really like that. But when he's yeah. like, oh, this is fucking great. You're like, oh, cool. <laughs> he, he likes it. Um, yeah. But, uh, he, he's, uh, yeah, he, he's, it buzzes effusively about the stuff that he likes. He rants and raves about the stuff that he hates. But if he's ambivalent about something, you'll, like, yeah, I can still talk about something that I don't really give a fuck about for a long time. Mitch yeah. just won't give it the time of day after a point. <laughs> He's like, done with us. <laughs> I feel like we should all aspire to be more like Mitch in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> this is kind of repeating stuff, but not really. <laughs> okay. If you could Good to know. Get, if you could guess the Men in Black Nebula, what was the thing called? Nebulizer? Oh, that's for us, that's for us, man. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> What's the thing called with the Men in Black? <laughs> the memory months. Zappa? Yeah. I don't we, know. The, that's, the, that sounds right. I don't know. Uh, the little red light? I don't know. I'll, I'll put it in the description. It sounds like Nebulizer. I know that Nebulizer is for asthmatics. I know, asthmatics, I know that now. Um, if you could get the Men in Black memory zapper and wipe your mind and play, and but you can only erase like one game from your mind. It doesn't have to be horror either. Uh, if you could erase one game from your mind and replay it again, start to finish with, without any memory of it, what what do you think it would be? Hmm, good question. Maybe, um, maybe the first Red Dead Redemption. Ooh, nice. That's certainly the first one that popped into my head. My head, like, yeah, that's maybe that, maybe Red Dead Redemption. That is a great answer because my mind was going to a lot of when when I was asked that question by a friend recently, my mind was going to a lot of places that were like my teen years. So like, but I I, I don't think wiping those games would have quite the same. Effect. Whereas as you say, wiping Red Dead One and then playing Red Dead Two first and then Red Dead One second, that would be. Amazing, because yeah. you actually see the story chronologically. I'll be honest, I, I would grab the, ne the memory zapper, nebulizer, off of you. <laughs> and I would remove several games that I've played and then never replay them. Oh, but that's like, fair. Uh, uh, there's 
particularly horror games, like because I, I've, I'll pretty much play anything that comes out. Uh, I have played a lot of garbage. Um, so there's stuff that I, I feel I've taken a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time on that ultimately didn't pay off at all. Mm. Uh, I would say like I spent a lot of time playing Dying Light. And I didn't oh, like it at any point. I was like, "This is." I was like, "This is." I was like, "Why am I? Sp- why have I spent forty hours playing this game? Like, I don't don't care. Like, I just don't care." Like, so I would just delete, die in light, and move on to the move on to something else. So. <laughs> it's funny because I had a similar experience with with Dead Island. I played Dead Island for like two hour, two hundred hours. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I fucking hated it. Like, I was like, this yeah, is yeah. I'm, I, I was kind of the same. Oh, which which actually brings very us, similar games actually. So, which brings us nicely to what you're playing at the moment. What are you playing at the moment, Andy? <laughs> uh well, I just finished Days Gone. Oh, it's so good! I love that game personally. Anyway, amazing. Um, I I really think it got a hard time. I think a lot of people probably read the reviews and slept on it because. Yeah, it can, I mean, it's it's no more or less repetitive than it. And that was a big criticism against it, that it was repetitive and there wasn't a lot of kind of mission variety. But that's a, that's a criticism you can level against any open world game. Like, no open world game is constantly exciting and, ref, and refreshing and revitalizing the genre. Every, every game has collect this, go over here, kill 10 of these, stab five of that. Like, it's... It's the cost of the open world game. I think is that that is what you have to do. Uh, lack of they, they talked as well about kind of lack of enemies. But again, like mm. when the world maybe is so next big, generation, you can only populate yeah. it with so many enemies. Uh, yeah, maybe next generation will have more variety in character models. But I, I think it's kind of redundant to criticize games for that when. What is your expectation here? Like, how how many character models do you want to be jammed in? Again, even one of the most impressive games of all time, The Last of Us, which is another game I would erase from my mind and replay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even that has extremely limited variety in the clickers. Like, yep. I don't know what what the expectation for reviewers is. Like, everyone is going to be an individual character and everyone is going to look exactly like totally I mean, different. Even going back to Resident Evil, like, I mean, Resident Evil was doing that in 1995, 1996, and Resident Evil 2 and 3 remake, which have just come out, still have repeated character models. Like, as you yeah. say, it's yeah. like it's part of the territory. Yeah, I, I just I, I, it just seems redundant to me to criticise a game for something that's kind of out with the control of any sensible development company. Like, mm. And plus, like, those um, moments when you come across the hordes, I think they pay off against any enemy encounters I've seen in some other games. Like, when you come across yeah, the I, hordes, the fear. <laughs> I, there was moments I was literally, like, standing up. Like, just... With my with the controller like with the left control stick just pushed forward and just running and running and just going, don't even turn around, don't even stop to look over your shoulder because they're right there. Yeah, like they're right. Just keep running. Like there's four or five hundred of these fucking zombies chasing you. That's <laughs> like, just it's that's silly. Like, <laughs> but it's so fucking impressive. But yeah, like I, it's funny because I think what a lot of people thought from Days Gone is. Because it was Sony again, and even though it wasn't the same development team, people thought, oh, this is going to be another Last of Us. And I think that that was a very unfair yeah. thing to put on it right out the gate because, as we said, Last of Us is in the league of its own from a storytelling perspective. Like, Yeah, and I, I think as well, I mean, it's the two games couldn't be more different. Like, They're not even length thematically beyond the fact that there's we're kind of in this post-apocalyptic yeah. situation and it's yeah and it's people just trying to live um but the two games are not similar at all um the one criticism i would agree with um as it kind of relates to days gone is there's so many vehicles dotted everywhere but you can only ride a motorbike <laughs> yeah. That's, That's really it. I mean, it's. I, I had a great time with Days Gone, um, and I would recommend Days Gone to anyone. I just, I would say, 
Uh, yeah, I think people were unnecessarily harsh on it. I don't know what it, I don't know if it was because it was delayed multiple times, and maybe mm. people thought that the, the end product was going to be far more maybe polished than it was. But I don't know. I just think I just think it was a bit a bit mean. <laughs> I'd agree. I. Uh, funny enough, I think it has been a very successful lockdown game because I've noticed, while I, even seeing you play it on my friends list, but I've seen loads of people on my friends list during this yes. uh, whole lockdown situation playing. It actually made me really happy because I was like, please, if this is doing well now, say that we might get a Days Gone 2 on PS5. You know, If it makes money, that's all Sony care about. Uh, if it yeah. makes money, we'll get a second one. Uh, and I think, from from what I'm aware, even though it wasn't a crit- huge critical darling, I think it made Sony a lot of cash. So I think, fingers crossed, we get a, a second shot at it down the line as well. Also, uh, excellent, excellent lead performance from the guy that plays Deacon. So good. One of the most believable kind of characters in a game. Yeah, like yeah. Consistent. Mm-hmm. He, so many games have characters that change so much that you're like, Jesus Christ, Like what happened here? Like The character went from this to this in this amount of time. But like Deacon St. John is just such a consistent character. Uh, mm, yeah. Uh, but you're also playing another game at the moment. You were telling me just before we came on. Well, yeah. <laughs> from, from one kind of open world game to another. Um, this just came out. I don't know when this, when this is going to air, Paddy, but this game just came out on Friday there. So what was that? The 22nd? Yeah. Um, it's uh, Manny. Oh. I did a trailer reaction here in the channel. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's out there in the world now, uh, and, and and I've I've got it. Um, I'll met. Did you I'll, pay I'll, I'll for I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> what, I choose, what I choose to do with my own money is uh, my own business. No, because um, I'm only asking because well, I, I did. <laughs> I'm just waiting for it to yeah. arrive. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, as the answer to that, thirty five. Uh, uh, but so far, it's not great. <laughs> the it, highlight of the game so f- is it fun? The bench? highlight of the game, uh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, well, <laughs> not really. Like, oh, no. Do you remember years ago when Jaws Unleashed came out? Vividly. <laughs> right. So it's it's kind of just like Jaws Unleashed, but it's not. The licensed IP. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It, it's, it's like the Poundland version. Because they have music in it that, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have music in it that touches very kind of slightly. It's like just cello music. So you're like, right, okay. This is as close as they're going to push this to Jaws without doing it. Uh, it's very, very silly, to be honest. Um, and I think it's got certainly limited playability. Um, but it's, we'll um, see. it's Techland. We'll see well, no, it's not, it, I'll, I'll stick with it. It's not Techland. It's Deep Silver who published it, and they're the same guys that published uh, Dead Island. And I think they look so similar, like all the kind of heightened mm-hmm. color palette and everything. When I saw the trailer from Any Girl, I was like, "This looks like Dead Island, but you're playing as a shark instead." And then, then part of me was like, "Why are you getting excited about this? You hated Dead Island." <laughs> um, <but. laughs> I just I, I'm thinking I, see, I, I hated silly. Jaws Unleashed <laughs> you, you'll get if you're expecting silly you, you'll definitely get silly because um, you've seen the trailer you, you you become a super powered electric fucking robot <laughs> shark by the end of it like you're you're completely like presumably you're so mad with power and that you're absolutely indestructible to anything else in the sea that's what, I, that's what I can imagine. I, I imagine you're so overpowered by the end of this game that nothing can touch you. I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing it here on the channel and probably watching me go from 10 minutes in being like, oh, this is so much fun, it's incredible, to like 20 hours in going like, oh, what a waste of money, what have I done with my life? <laughs> I don't even think you'll get to 20 hours party if i'm honest I, I think i think i read somewhere that if you hammer it you'll get through it in five 
Um, but if you try to do all, if you try to do all the the kind of side missions, which are like I was talking about, it's like <laughs> go here, kill this, kill, kill this alligator, go over here, kill ten groupers. Over there, you'll find a barracuda. Kill it. <laughs> uh, it, so far it's it's very much it's very much like that um but some of it looks okay uh the the highlight for me is that chris parnell does the he's the narrator oh no way yeah from so he, he no uh from it's archer and, and, yeah from archer and 30 rock and yeah um, yeah oh i love so, dr uh, spachemin yeah yeah so uh <laughs> yeah he he's kind of the highlight he just kind of talks to you the whole time you're playing the game, so uh, yeah, we'll that see. But I, I don't have I don't have high hopes for it, Paddy. Beyond uh, the li- very limited time that I've spent on it so far, now, I've got an eight month old Paddy. I can't <laughs> I, I can't spend that much. Time I, I perfected games. the craft when I was when, when Piper was born of of cradling her in such a way that I could still game. It's it's a very important well, see, trait. I do that with Nathan, and then the other day I went out and I bought him a little kid's video game controller. No way! So that he can kind of feel involved. <laughs> You're um, a much more conscientious I could, father than I. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I guess I could just put down the controller and be a dad. Really. <laughs> but, um, I don't feel uh, I'm there yet. Speaking of, kind of, well, going beyond this conversation, what? I, I have a feeling there's one game. Uh, upcoming that both of us are, are very hotly uh, anticipating but yeah what what's what are you looking at in the future that you're like oh that looks like something that's better champ um i'm obviously obviously going to get my hands on uh the last of us too even after everything that's come out in the past couple of weeks about the way naughty dog treat their staff the leaks that came out about the story um, I'm still going to obviously play it because I feel like I've invested so much time waiting for it <laughs> that I, I keep getting these emails to tell me that it's been pushed back from like my pre-order's been pushed back from Amazon like so many fucking times uh, that I'm obviously going to buy it and going to play it uh, but my expectations have been lowered slightly for it um, I'm looking forward to Cyberpunk yeah. how, whatever the number is at the end of that <laughs> Uh, I'm looking forward to, what is it, Ghost of Tsushima? Yeah, the, the Soccer Punch game. That yeah. Yep. Very cool. Um, I mean, you're a big fan of, of those kind of movies and stuff anyway as well, aren't you? You're a big fan of like Samurai, Samurai Warriors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I, I can't even, I'm kind of blanking on what else is coming out this year. I feel like those are the three that, because we're coming to the end of, of console's lifespan, I feel like you always get a pullback on new release. You get a couple of really high level new releases, but they're also mm. much fewer and further between because everybody's kind of getting ready for the next wave or whatever. Um, yeah. And you tend to find that these kind of high level AAA releases, they have also been in the background being kind of made for the next generation. And then within, within a few months of the next generation going live, then those games will come back out and they'll be all singing, all dancing, next generation. Remasters, right? they did yeah. with, I guess they did it with, yeah, yeah, they, they did it with Grand Theft Auto and stuff like that. So and Last of Us. I would fully expect yeah. that to be the same. Last of Us, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah so. um, I guess even Alien Isolation, although that yeah. might have just been cross-generation at the time it came out. That's another great game, by the way. I just I, I can't come on and talk about survival horror on oh, video games. And body horror. Oh shit! Alien it was, isolation. Maybe it was low hanging yeah. fruit, but when we talked about body horror, that was yeah, probably low hanging fruit. But yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that it's... game scared the fucking bejesus out. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I found myself not being able to play it because I found I was spending so much time crouched in a locker or a vent or whatever that I was like spending 20, 20, 25 minutes there that I was like, fuck, my life is passing me by. you just stuck in this locker. <laughs> yeah, and, but ultimately it will find you if you stay in the locker, right? So you might as well just get out in the world because I found myself doing that as well. I was like, I could just stay here. Can I just stay here indefinitely and just <laughs> go down with the ship? I'm more than happy to let this shit blow up around me. Like it seems like the easier option at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, it was. It's a great. It's an absolutely great game. Oh, and, uh, it I, better. And, 
Yeah, and that came out at a really cool time when stuff like Until Dawn came out as well. So and the evil thing. Cool yeah, there run. was. There was. Yeah. That, that was a good era for survival horror, definitely. The evil within did was drove me crazy. Like it was so fucking difficult. <laughs> it's like, so hard. Uh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dude, I want to thank you so much for coming on and talking to me here. Uh, I'll drop links in the description to all of sure. your stuff. Uh, I'll drop it to Strong Language and whatever you whatever you want me to drive people towards. Uh, cool. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, definitely check out Andy's podcast, Andy and Mitch's podcast, Strong Language Violent Scenes. Also, your vi- your movies are up on Vimeo. Yeah, yeah, you can find them on Vimeo. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully soon I can start putting new stuff on there whenever we're allowed out of the house. Um, so the idea of, some stuff. of a new Andy Stewart just has me very excited. Like a new Andy Stewart production uh, is always not control, you, control yourself, Paddy. The last few <laughs> didn't quite work out, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, and I, I'm on I, I'm on PlayStation as well. You can, if you want to see what shit I'm playing after man. Uh, I keep saying wanting to say man. <laughs> that would be. A, it feels like that would be. A, I'd rather watch Francis Dollarhide swimming. <laughs> And killing people with his big fake teeth, then, uh, then I think I would. Yeah, yeah, I'd definitely rather that than be the shark at this uh, yeah. point. But we'll see how it goes. It might get better as I get more overpowered. But right now, I'm just getting savaged by alligators at every turn. Oh fuck's sake! Alligators just messing your shit up. That's it. <laughs> uh, Eddie, thanks so much, man. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, and keep up the amazing work. Thank you, Paddy. I love you loads. Love you. I'll see you soon. And so there you have it. That was my interview with the fantastic Andy Stewart, who is a writer, director, producer, podcaster uh, extraordinaire. Uh, Andy has been involved in some of my favorite projects. He wrote, directed, and produced uh, Dysmorphia, Split, Inc., and Remnant, uh, which are available at his Vimeo. I will drop a link in the description, as per always. Um, But he also produced David Malcolm's short, Mannequins. uh, Mannequins? Mannequins? (laughs) Mannequins. There we go. Like Mannequin Skywalker. Got it. Uh, Yeah, so he produced Mannequins, which is uh, David Malcolm's short. I mentioned Dave Malcolm uh, Random Elements here during one of my news episodes uh, when I was highlighting some of his awesome graphic, graphic design work. But yeah... Uh, and then on top of that, as I say, Andy and Mitch have been running Strong Language of Violent Scenes for well over 100 episodes. A lot more if you factor in the weekly minisode. Minisode? Minisodes? What the hell is up with my talking today, guys? It's gone. Uh, they're minisodes, including the minisodes. There's well over 100. But yeah, uh, I just want to give Andy a massive thank you for coming on to talk to me about all things survival horror. I knew when I started this channel that he was one of the people I wanted to get on to talk to me because I know that he's every bit as passionate, if not more so, as me, than, than me or as... My word quota is used up for the week slash month. Um, but no, I knew I wanted to get Andy on because he is somebody that really eats, sleeps, and breathes this stuff. So, yeah. Uh, I will say that so far, I'm only about an hour in, but so far, I do slightly disagree on many either. I'm having a hell of a lot of fun with it. But then again, my expectations were incredibly low and measured off the back of uh, this conversation with Andy. So, yeah. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. Definitely head down to the description below and hop over to Strong Language Violent Scenes podcast on Podbean and check it out because these guys, des- or check on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts, really. Uh, what Andy and Mitch do is phenomenal. Uh, I must also give a quick plug here that Mitch has done the new theme music for the show, uh, which I've wanted to work with Mitch Bain for ages, so this was an awesome opportunity. And, yeah, uh, Huge kudos to Andy, and uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. As always, if you did, there's a like button below. If you hit that, you will show me that you liked it, and I will appreciate it massively. And there's also a subscribe button, and if you haven't done so already, if you hit that subscribe button, it will make me a very happy petty altogether. Um, I will be buzzing, so I will. So yeah, please consider uh, hitting those and sticking around. There's also a bell notification icon. If you hit that, you'll get a notification every time a video goes live. Maybe you want to, maybe you don't. Whatever the case, it's all good with me. I'm just happy you're here checking out the video. But yeah, thank you guys so much, and as always, let's survive together. Peace out. Peace out.